Hello everyone, I, Ananya Chitranchi from Corporate Law Journal, welcome you to this channel. As you all know, the purpose of this initiative is to explore corporate literacy and to impart legal education in a simple and lucid manner. In today's session, we will be talking about the blanket suspension on IBC. Before we start with today's session, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon for more updates on corporate and commercial law. Decoding the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code Amendment, Ordinance 2020 Before we begin to decode the ordinance, let us first understand the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code. It was brought into effect on 28th of May 2016. Previous to this enactment, the laws regarding insolvency were multiple in nature and quite complex. Hence, the initial aim of the code was to bring all legal aspects relating to reorganization and insolvency resolution for corporations under a single umbrella. In addition to this, it also intended to rectify the lacunas present in previous legislations such as the Sikh Industrial Companies Act of 1985 and the subsequent Sikh Industrial Companies Special Provision Act of 2003. A recent amendment to the code was brought about on the 5th of June 2020. The ordinance was essentially brought in because of the economic burden imposed as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to a disruption in business activities. To rectify this, the ordinance put a suspension on the code for a period of six months extending up to one year. This applies on all cases of insolvency filed on or after 25th of March 2020. It was done by way of notification of Section 10A and the introduction of Subclause 3 to Section 66 of the Code. Relaxation Measures Due to the economic burden, certain relaxation measures were introduced. The Dates the ordinance mentioned a suspension for a period of six months, extending up to a year. This commences from the 25th of March, 2020. Initially, the provisions were supposed to be in place till the 24th of September, 2020. However, by a recent notification on the 25th of September, it has been extended for a period of three more months, that is, it is to be in place till the 24th of December 2020. The government, by way of another notification, may extend it till one year, that will be 24th of March of next year, 2021. Relaxation Timeline Timelines are of the essence because IBC's objective is to minimize the time consumed in the process. However, given the current situation with the pandemic and the lockdown, relaxation was given. This was done by way of the introduction of Regulation 40C to the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India Insolvency Resolution Process for Corporate Persons Regulations 2016. This exempted the lockdown period from any and all activities which could not be conducted during the lockdown with respect to the CIRP. Announcements made The Finance Ministry under their Atma Nirbhar Bharat Yodhna on 17th May 2020 made some major policy changes to the CIRP timelines and the IBC. However, these were very vague in nature and raised a lot of questions from the stakeholders. So, as we have clarification, an ordinance was brought in, the IBC Amendment Ordinance 2020, which concretely defined disruption period. Overview of relaxation measures over time. Post the declaration of lockdown, a series of relaxation measures were announced, starting with 24th of March 2020. The Ministry of Corporate Affairs, by way of notification, raised the threshold for default filing of application of CIRP from 1 lakh rupees to 1 crore under section 4 of the code. Subsequently, on the 29th of March 2020, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India introduced section 40C to the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board of India Insolvency Resolution Process for Corporate Persons Regulations 2016. Furthermore, on the 5th of June 2020, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Board Amendment Ordinance was passed. This put a blanket suspension 
on the application of fresh insolvency cases for a period of six months. IBC Ordinance 2020 with special attention drawn to the following provisions. Section 4 bars a corporate debtor from initiating CIRP against another corporate debtor. Whereas Section 8 of the Code states that a resolution professional will continue to manage the operations of a corporate debtor unless an order approving a new resolution plan is passed under Section 31 subclause 1 or a liquidator is appointed under Section 34 of the Code. Coming to the recently added Section 10A of the Code, ordinarily CIRP is a mechanism by which creditors may recover from corporate debtors. This may be availed by financial creditors under Section 7, operational creditors under Section 9, and corporate debtors themselves under Section 10. However, with the introduction of Section 10A, a blanket suspension has been put on Section 7, 9, and 10. This means that financial creditors, operational creditors, and corporate debtors themselves cannot file any fresh cases of default which arise on or after 25th of March till the disruption period. Additionally, Section 10A contains a proviso stating that no application for insolvency shall ever be filed against a debtor for default occurring during this disruption period. Prime FSI, the application of this suspension applies to any case on or post 25th of March. But a plain reading of the proviso would lead one to believe that no case will ever be filed even after the expiry of the disruption period. Now coming to section 66, which focuses on fraudulent trading or wrongful trading and compounds the working on due diligence. Subclause 2 of this section empowers a resolution professional to file an application during CIRP to any adjudicating authority to direct a corporate debtor to be liable for contribution to the assets. However, the introduction of subclause 3 bars any resolution professional from making an application under subclause 2. In case a creditor adopted the arbitration process or a civil proceeding during this period and obtained an award or decree, the creditor can then institute proceedings under IBC Section 34 for setting aside the arbitral award. Moreover, creditors can take recourse under Commercial Course Act 2015 and lenders can take over management of a company under Surfacey Act 2002 if they hold a mortgage over the immovable property of a debtor. Impact can also be ascertained via certain cases with respect to this ordinance. In the case of Gaurav Hargobind Bhai versus Asset Reconstruction Company, the Supreme Court noted that the period of limitation begins as soon as the corporate debtor is classified as a non-performing asset and thus determine default and whether exemptions can be made under this ordinance or not. The Vashudev R. Bhojwani v. Abudai Cooperative Bank case was used as reference in the above mentioned case. And herein, the Supreme Court noted default and whether continuous cause of action can be argued by creditors to exclude the application under the ordinance. Furthermore, in the case of Andhra Bank v. Lanco Thermal Power Limited, it was held to be a fit case as the corporate debtor admitted the default and the financial creditor initiated proceedings outside the RBI circular. In conclusion, there is no doubt that this ordinance may be used as an obvious scapegoat for corporations. Moreover, financial creditors such as banks, which already face a three-month moratorium, will face major hits. The silver lining here is it may be help to struggling companies and may prevent some creditors from accepting haircut settlements. However, it should be noted that the financial strain that has been so devastating for corporate entities may eventually run them out of business and this ordinance may not be enough to keep them alive. Thank you for watching.